Hello everyone, how are you doing today? Welcome new subscribers. Thank you subscribers for following, sharing, and liking the channel. Welcome new subscribers. Uh, welcome all subscribers. We appreciate you and all your support, loved ones. Today, I'm come, my name is Reverend Penelope Stewart. You can follow Chemistry on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Okay, today I am coming to you with a brand new book. Really good book. I thought it was good, but it's, you know, this author right here breaks down the relationship with our ancestors in such an analytical, metaphysical uh, way. Uh, you know, the description, he's breaking it all the way down. Like I say, uh, this is really a science when you start looking at your relationship with spirit and looking at your psychology and how you do things, uh, looking at you and your family tree. Uh, you really see the science in it, in the relationship uh, that you have with spirit. But the name of this book is Communing with the Ancestors, Your Spirit Guides, Bloodline, Allies, and the Cycle of Reincarnation. I thought this was a very interesting book. Uh, I do recommend it. It was a good read. Uh, uh, some of the things in here I disagree with. I get, and I would say partially disagree because this book was written from uh, uh, another culture perspective, but Bob really uh, found a very interesting way of connecting our relationship with our ancestors. So some of the things that in here I, I really agree. Most of the things I do, and then some of the things I don't. But this is a really I do recommend this book if you're. Uh, one to understand the relationship and the metaphysical science um, perspective. You know, seeing your connection with your ancestors and just how close they are to you in a science way. So, in a scientific way. This is a really good book. Uh, I do recommend it. It's about... Let me see how many chapters do we have. I think I got this book from um, from Amazon. It has nine chapters. The first chapter is Spiritual Heirlooms. The second chapter, Ancestors, Old Lore and Memories. The third chapter, Long Winding Road. Number chapter four, There Are There and Back Again, The Soul's Return. Uh, chapter 5, Death and Rebirth. Chapter 6, Ancestors and the Spirit Wisdom. Chapter 7, The Starry Path of the Round. 8, Through the Gates of Evening. 9, The Rites of Connection. So, you know, really good. Some, you know, really, um, this is really a scientific explanation if you just want to look at it from a scientific perspective. Um, you know, I wouldn't say it's for everybody, but if you want to deepen your understanding of your relationship with your ancestors and just on a scientific level, I do recommend the book. Uh, let's see, the book is 185 pages. All right, so you might want to slowly read this book. Uh, it took me maybe probably a week to read it, maybe, because I want it's the slow read. That's because a lot of the scientific terms, you know, I really had to slow down and think and contemplate some of the things that he was saying in here. So, um, yeah, let me just read this first chapter called uh, Spiritual Heirlooms. All primitive stories tell us that the ancestral gods came to earth and scattered bits of flame from within themselves, which went on to become the human race. These spirit flames that were passed from gods then flowed through generations of humans that followed this ancient time and mystical event. Perhaps the heart of this theme is reflected in the custom of people seated before a fire sharing stories and family tales. The ancestral flame is inherent in each living generation. Its light is within you, 
at this very moment. It can illuminate the past, present, and future if you carry it there. And it goes on. Death is inevitable. As the last breath of your body leaves, leaves us, we go out with it to the mountaintop that looks out upon the rim of our ancestors. At birth, with the first breath of our new body, our ancestors have returned us to the world of mortal kind. Once free of of the womb to draw the breath, we carry out the sorrow, knowing that our feet fell short, reaching the hidden realm. And we also cry out with astonishment at the road we must travel once again in the flesh. The way to the ancestors and to the starry path beyond, when newborns well, pathways open. It is the life breath that unites us with our ancestors. On our breath is carried the memories of them when we speak about those who came before us. On our breath is carried the prayers and chants that we raise for the ancestors. Breath passes through the blood within our lungs and in our blood is the connection back to bone, back to all that comes from within the bone. The ancestors are the mirror of the bone memory. Breath allows the ancestors to rise within us and for us to submerge within them. In the human fetus, marrow first appears in the clavicles, the collarbones. The name clavicle comes from the Latin word little key and is descriptive of shape of the bone, which looks like an old-fashioned skeleton key. Within the bones is a membrane that prevents cells that have not matured from passing into the greater body through the bloodstream. In metaphysics, there's also a membrane that prevents immature souls from eluding the will of rebirth and slipping into a greater body of reality. Guardians and keys are always present at the gates between life, death, and renewal. When our breath carries the words we speak to someone about our ancestors, they hear us on the voice of the wind. The ancestors are said to travel out upon our life's breath, which carries them into the next generation. When their stories continue to be passed on from generation to generation. And if we are faithful bearers of the story, then we too are carried upon the breath of the living. When we pass from world of mortal kind, through the gate of death. That's why I think shadow work is so important and doing the healing work. For me, finding out more about my ancestors, they would just like tell our story. So through my trauma, I can find out where my trauma come from. And usually through the trauma, that's the ancestors. That's just the way I look at it because the trauma is some patterns that was experienced in your bloodline. So when I start looking at the traumas, at looking at the ancestors' line and looking at all the trauma, then I start looking at each one's story that experienced their own trauma. So there's those stories need to be told to the future, future generation so they will know the story of the ancestors and uh, our duty to correct some of it. So yeah, I, I don't know that I, don't, I hope you I hope that made sense to you. Uh, I I guess I'll, I'll read on. He says in the book of in the book the cry of the Kahuna, Moki Kupahia describes himself as a hereditary scribe serving the ancestral voices of his lineage. This can be true for all of us if we choose to take on this role. The arm and the reach of our ancestors is very long. Its elbow is pressed into the past, its forearms extend into the present, and its hand reaches to touch the future. It seems that many people think of the ancestors as being something entirely of the past. This view can extend to thinking of the ancestors as part of the dead and distant world. Have remembered, if remembered at all. However, the ancestors are conscious being, beings and they are not detached from the world of the living. We can, touch the, we can touch them and talk to them because they are everywhere. So you heard that there, that was a really, and that's just in 
chapter one, the spiritual air heirloom. When you start, you know, that's that's your heirloom. Uh, I want to go into another one. I thought this was an interesting chapter, chapter six, the ancestors and the spirit wisdom. Uh, I think this is on page 105. Ancestors and spirit wisdom. We are all aware of the statement, get off my back, and this meaning of being driven or hounded by others. We often regard the situation as one of the of being criticized, but there is another backrider back to examine. It is a spiritual concept. One teaching is that we are accompanied in life by one of the ancestors from the collective of ancestral spirit. This being is sometimes called the mind rider or spirit rider. I prefer, prefer the latter term. As mentioned in the preface to this book, the spirit rider shares a common quality with the Mayan virgin vision serpent. The spirit rider is an ancestor that can come and go between mortal realm and the ancestral realm. It is said to attach itself to the spine of the descendant and ride with her or him. The spirit rider is seen as a serpent or a replica form resembling the shape of a human spine. Its head is positioned with the so-called primitive brain associated with the area of the brain stem. The spirit rider does not always remain with the host body, but can and does rejoin the ancestors in their realm from time to time. One, one of the things that the spirit rider does is called fetching. This means it can take our consciousness to another place or realm. Spiritual or magical visions are often a result of being fetched away. The spirit rider can also fetch another ancestor and bring it to the descendant. Without understanding the fetch and how it works, a person can feel psychotic or as if one is going through an emotional breakdown. Fortunately, most of the work of the spirit rider goes unnoticed to the conscious minds unless the person has had some some training or alignment practice. That's I thought that was very interesting. Uh that that whole paragraph it was very interesting. There is one exception to this and it is associated with what some people call chill of information that is a tingling feeling up to the spine. It manifests when some greater truth is acknowledged in our being. This sensation is the spirit rider, rider moving in the spine. It's drawing our consciousness to appreciate the words being spoken. Such communication from the soul meant for benefit of the human consciousness. From the mystical view, the spirit rider carries the ancestral eye of the past with it. In context, mystics envisions the rider as a snake carrying one eye in its, its, uh, in its open mouth. Through this and through us, it can see the world of the living, and it can help us to see the world of the past. It can also give us vision into the future. The idea of one eye shows us in the myth of the Norns, who are fate beings in the Northern Europe. It appears in legend of Persis who encounters three sorceries share one eye that can be passed around between them. Perhaps the mythical theme of the one eye is a remnant of the very old beliefs of the ancestral vision. So, uh, like I said, that, that was a good chapter. I'm going to read one more thing. Read one more thing. Uh, I'm going to read one more thing and then I'm going to close out. And I think this is chapter 7, the starry path of the round. Because it said that, you know, we are our stars. You know, if we can read the star, that's what that psychology, looking at the psychology and looking at um, the stars and, and how, looking at the zodiac and looking at the psychology of these zodiacs, we learn more about ourselves. So we get to looking at the stars because that's what we are. Uh, we are, uh, those are our ancestors, so to speak. So we get to looking at our makeup and the, the dark and lighter parts of ourselves and looking at what we need to heal in ourselves. Uh, we start to balance things out more.
So, uh, and I'm going through that right now. Uh, it's something else. I'm going through, I uh, think, the key of renewal right now because that's been coming up in my reading. So, uh, yeah. Okay. This is page 121, chapter 7, The Starry Path of the Round. In this chapter, we will tie some things together from other chapters, and we will look deeper into the idea of old ancestral gods. These old stories are important for two reasons. The first reason is they preserve a mindset, if not an actual history. Mindsets are important because they connect firmly with the currents or streams upon which, the fir which they firmly draw. The greater importance is not whether we are looking at memory or perception. The importance is what arises in our spirit because of these tales. The second important reason is that what we stay connected with is what draws that person, place, or thing deeper into our lives and inner spirits. Through mind and body and soul, we build and maintain bridges of thought, emotions, and longing. There is a metaphysical principle that states, like attract like. This means that we attract to ourselves the things that resonate with our personal energy vibration. That is both good news and bad news. The condition of our lives are a reflection of active principle, and it reveals our heart in light or darkness. Does your heart include or exclude? By studying this stellar-based lore of our origins, we draw closer to the principle and energies they hold for us. We can follow the energy trail across time, become bearers of it ourselves. Within us, we carry the flame passed, passed to us from our creators. It forges the mind and the spirit. It is an essence circulating flame that lights the way from the origin to life to death and to rebirth. Its flickering light is a promise of return to the stars. We return home to our ancestors, the stars. We need only let it burn within the sh and shine without. Okay, so, um, yeah. Like I said, get this book. I think it's a really good book. Uh, if you want to understand things from a metaphysical point, standpoint, a perspective, I recommend it. Only those that are interested in it for that reason. I wouldn't recommend it like to everyone because it's so you really have to slow down and read it. Okay, thank you for being here today, loved ones. Hopefully, I'll be doing some more readings, a uh, free reading soon. I've just been so busy. Uh, this transition has ha had me, you know, trying to uh, readjust my time. But hopefully I'll be coming here giving some free reading soon. Thank you so much for being here today with me, loved ones. Light, love. Uh, ashe. Namaste, loved ones.